welcome everyone to our Caltech Astronomy Stargazing Lecture for the month of May. Um, I will be your MC this evening. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a computational astrophysicist in the astronomy department at Caltech. So welcome. Thanks for everybody for coming. I hope everyone's week is going well. Uh, we have a super exciting evening tonight, evening's program with a uh, really interesting talk on pulsars and neutron stars coming up. Just a quick layout of our schedule for this evening. In a couple minutes, I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Amruta Zaudand, who will be talking about pulsars. And then following that, that'll be about 30 minutes or so long. And then after she's done, we will have a Q&A, not just of Amruta and myself, but two other members of the department as well, Dr. Gina Panupulu and proto-doctor, soon-to-be doctor, uh, Shreyas Vizapragada, who are both experts in um, the interstellar medium that forms into stars, as well as exoplanets. So it should be very interesting. And, and we're here to answer your questions. So you, in either the, the YouTube Live interface or the Facebook Live interface, you can type in your questions about the content of the talk that Amruta is about to give, or just questions about space science and physics and astronomy, and our our, our panelists, we will all try and 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 can respond to whatever questions you can throw at us. Um, and we'll take that all the way for two hours until nine o'clock tonight, before we end. So these events happen once a month on a Friday night. Our next one will be up about a month from now. Um, and it will, I don't yet have a topic for it, but it'll be a senior professor in the physics department here at Caltech. And next, we also have a sister series of events called Astronomy on Tap, which are uh, less formal. They tend to, they historically took place in a, in a pub and consist of two 15 minute presentations and then a, a pub trivia session with 10 astronomy themed pub quest or trivia questions for, for you guys. And it's all interactive and you guys can, can click on responses and it pops up here on our screen and uh, it's, it's super fun. So that will also, those are on Monday nights and our next one of those is in about two, two and a half weeks. Um, yeah, yeah, I think those are, those are our main, oh, uh, our, also next month, we will have an astronomy on tap in Mandarin Chinese. We did one a couple of months ago and it was very successful. Uh, we had 8,000 audience members, um, mostly in China, but it was pretty awesome. So we're gonna do that again uh, next month. And we had one in Spanish this week with not 8,000 uh, people connecting to, but it was, still, it was still interesting. So we'll continue to do that. But um, those are all the announcements for me. So can I invite you on Dr. Amruta Zaudan. Welcome. How are you? Hi, I'm doing really good. I'm very excited for today. So Yeah, me too. Me yeah. too. Looking forward to talking about pulsars. Yes. Cool. Uh, let's see. So I will introduce our speaker. Dr. Amruta Zaudan is a postdoctoral researcher in the New Star Group at Caltech. She works on stars left behind in the wake of supernova explosions, pul pulsars, to understand how they evolve a few billion years down the line after that supernova explosion occurred. Amruta uses a network of ground and space-based telescopes to arrive at an understanding of this. Uh, in addition, she enjoys spending time with her very energetic Australian cattle dog, going on hikes, long walks, and excelling at fetch. Uh, and she's passionate about wildlife and habitat restoration in fire affected areas. Well, there's sur surely no shortage of uh, fire affected areas around here. Have you, have you had the opportunity to go into, uh, into the San Gabriels and see some of the, the, the effects of the bobcat fire from last summer? Yeah, actually. And it was pretty close to the site where we were planting vines. Um, so luckily it was cleared just before the fire, the external areas of it, um, because uh, we were going to plant there. And so the fire didn't really go through all of the pine trees. So I'm like really oh. happy about it because we spent a lot of the last winter bringing up new pines in that area. Wow. So, yeah. What, what area is it? 
Uh, so this is above Adler Saddle. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So in that particular small refine. Nice. Yeah. All right, well, enough about habitat restoration. I think our audience wants to mostly hear about pulsars. Yeah. You wanna share your screen? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so. All right, and. Looks good. Yeah, you can see the slide and the pointer. Just confirming. Uh, I don't <laughs> see the pointer now. I see, I see. Oh, now I see it. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. It has to be exaggerated. Okay. So, hello, all of you. Uh, my name is Amrita, and thank you to Cameron for such a wonderful introduction. I'm very excited to be here today, and I'm so glad and it means so much that all of you could make it to hear about these exciting objects that have captured my attention for the last five to six years. So. Today, we would be going on a journey to see these really oddballs called pulsars and how a lot of the weird ones are completely changing our understanding of the universe. So to begin with, uh, this story started in 1968, uh, 67 to be honest, with Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who was a PhD student at that point of time. Uh, and she was trying to assemble these antennas that you can see in this picture behind her and construct a grid of them to try and detect energetic electromagnetic emission from supermassive black holes called quasars. So this particular radio observatory is called Millard Radio Astronomy Observatory, and this is in UK Cambridge. So at that point of time, when Jocelyn Belvernal had joined Cambridge, she thought, oh, I fell into this position and this must be an accident. So while I'm here, until they realize that I am uh, not eligible to be here, I'm going to run, work the hardest possible that I've ever worked in my life. And so, in fact, in those days, when you were trying to use such radio dishes and trying to get signals from outer space, what you would be looking at is a small needle with voltage fluctuations, which would record it like a seismograph going over miles and miles of papers to find any astrophysical signal. So being very cautious and minutious, Justin Belvernal started pouring over miles and miles of such chart papers. Now in this left image, you can see this really small scruff called CP1919. So this graph kept appearing and reappearing in some of the chart papers and Justin Bell Bernal noticed it. She was like, oh, this particular scruff keeps arriving four minutes earlier uh, every time that she observes it. So this must be of celestial origin. And she went to her PhD advisor at that point of time called Anthony Hewish, and she said, um, I think this might be an actual astrophysical object and he was pretty skeptical at that point of time. Um, he thought this must be some sort of an interference, which is a disturbance in radio data, maybe a car's radio that has been passing through nearby. And they tried to check the equipment and looked for all of the possible problems that could happen, but couldn't find anything. So at that point, what Jocelyn Bell did was she asked her supervisor, hey, can we increase the rate at which we feed a paper to this machine? So can we make it much faster? So if this signal is repeating, we would be able to catch it. She had that intuition. And so when they did this, what happened is they could see these pulses, the extremely small, these kind of signals appearing at a regular interval of about 1.3 seconds. And this is how they could figure out, oh, this, the, given the fact that it's repeating this way and the way it arrives to us, you know, over a period of time, this must be an object in space that we don't yet know about because also it did not match any of the other stars that they knew. And so funnily, Justin Bell said, let's call it a little green man, just to play on the idea of it being alien to us. But then in that same year, they found more and more signals, which further confirmed that these were actual different kind of stars that they hadn't seen before. Now in 1932, uh, Zwicky and Bad had said 
in an idea that there must be some sort of stars which are extremely high density that are packed with some of the densest parts of the atoms. And these would be left behind after a star, which has been a massive star and it has reached the end point of its lifetime undergoes a supernova explosion. In 1972, they were finally able to connect these dots and show that indeed these objects that they were seeing must be those stars, the neutron stars, but because they are pulsating and we are getting these energetic emissions from them, these pulsating stars were abbreviated as pulsars. So here is a little video of what this idea looks like. So you have a massive star, it's exhausted all its fuel and undergoes supernova explosion. It blows out its external shale, leaving behind this extremely dense compact object in the wake of such a massive explosion. So this compact object is our neutron star. And so why are we talking about these stars? Why are they so important if we want to ask ourselves? Is because they are staggering. What you do is you take the recipe for making the stars is you take 1.4 times the mass of our sun and then you compress it in a tiny ball with a radius of about 6.2 miles. That is almost smaller than the size of a small town in America. And then if you want to understand how densely packed this star is, if you take a teaspoon of it, it would weigh way more than 4 billion tons on our planet Earth. And to add to that, these stars not only are so crazy dense, they rotate so fast that it's almost faster than the amount of time you would take to blink. So in about a few seconds to milliseconds, and they have intense gravity, which is about 2 billion times what we are experiencing on earth. So if you ever try to go near it, we will get squished instantly. And to add to all of that, on top of it all, the most beautiful thing about neutron stars is their ginormous magnetic field. To equivalent, do you know, understand an equivalent of this magnetic field, a comparison is you take 2000, uh, so you take about 2000 million, you know, fridge, sorry, you take about 100 billion fridge magnets and you put them in a heap leading to this, total magnetic field that you would have ever seen. So these are the strongest magnets in the universe. And because these are the strongest magnets in the universe, and what if what happens if they have free charge around it? And because they are rotating so fast is that they would accelerate those free charges at a really rapid speed that is equal to the speed of light. In this process of accelerating extremely charged particles, they release tremendous amount of energy, copious amount of energetic emission from their poles, looking like lighthouses in the sky. So when this energetic beam crosses our line of sight, we register a signal. We say, okay, I have just seen a new pulse. For example, this is a simulation of what a pulsar rotation looks like and what kind of pulses we record with radio telescopes. And so what you do is you collect these individual pulses every time they pass on Earth and you take all of these individual pulses and stack them up, giving a very, very beautiful joint profile. This kind of a profile that you see in the signal is a signature of any given pulsar. This profile stays constant over a period of time and it becomes the identity that if you're looking in this patch of the sky in this small diameter, this is the pulsar that you're looking at. So what we can also do then is to collect such kind of pulses and find new pulsars in space. And to do that, we use powerful radio dishes. For example, this is an image of Robert C. Bayard Green Bank Telescope. The reflected dish that you see here, it's about 100 multiplied by 110 meters uh, in its surface area. So if you want to compare that to an adult human, there is a small person on the left-hand side corner for scale. 
And I blew up this and inset to show how that small person compares to this ginormous structure. So as you can see, the scale of this telescope is just vast. And what it can do is then this dish collects all of the faint radio signals that are coming from pulsars far, far away from us. And the receiver antenna here collects all of the rays that are coming in over here. Those receivers are then able to provide us data to find more and more pulsar systems. Another innovative idea to design such radio telescopes is the Arecibo telescope that recently uh, suffered a really sad demise, however. So this idea of Arecibo telescope is pretty ingenious. What they did is they put a dish, which is about 305 meter in diameter at the base of a valley. So the whole base of the valley was used as a place to keep this radio dish. And then a structure was built on the top, which is the Gregorian dome that you can see here, suspended by uh, pretty strong support cables. And this structure is about the size of a building, which is at least three story high. So for example, in the movie GoldenEye, James Bond was actually uh, you know, asked to climb this structure with a small uh, ladder that astronomers climb on a regular basis. And he was really scared. He didn't want to do it, but astronomers are like, oh yeah, it's 11 o'clock at night. Uh, the telescope you know, needs to be controlled. So I'm going to climb up and go into this Gregorian dome. So this particular telescope was also featured in another really interesting movie that a lot of you uh, might have seen uh, over the time. Uh, I'm going to leave this as a question. A movie that also features some other radio dishes in US and there are some aliens in Vega. When we finish this talk, I hope someone has an answer for me. So anyway, so what you can do is you use these powerful radio telescope dishes and you point them to the sky and collect as much radio data as you can. And then you stack up those radio data sets to maximize the ability to find new pulsars. And this sort of a search strategy has resulted in about 2,659 pulsars in the last 50 years. If you look at these pulsars, you can roughly distribute them into different groups. You can say, okay, we have really young pulsars which were just born when a massive star underwent supernova and they have pretty high magnetic fields. These are also the pulsars uh, that are spinning pretty fast. Then you have young pulsars but cranked up magnetic fields called magnetars. As these young pulsars grow old because they lose energy as they're spinning over a period of time, they become what are called the normal pulsars. So this is almost like a human evolution. And as time goes, they get older and they get fainter, the radio emission gets weaker, they pass into the shaded area called as the pulsar graveyard. Now here is where we differ in terms of the lifeline, lifetime of pulsars and us. Sometimes when these pulsars are in the graveyard, they can find a companion, a, another star that is able to transfer a lot of mass and angular momentum onto the neutron star. And this would lead to rejuvenation of this almost dead old pulsar to really rapid spin periods where it's rotating about 700 times in a second. And these are called the millisecond pulsars. So now, because we have found so many pulsars, we have also been able to identify some of the weirdest outliers in the data sets and some of the really fun objects that are now teaching us new ideas about astronomy. So for example, this here is the Crab Nebula. So in 1054, Chinese astronomers recorded a really bright flash from the constellation Taurus. So, and now 1100 years later, because we have powerful observatories that are provided by NASA in different lights, we can probe this structure and understand what that powerful flash was. So, you know how you go to 
a seaside and you have different uh, shades, like, you know, uh, shades on. And if your shades have different filters, maybe you have a green color shades or red color uh, sunglasses or blue color sunglasses, and the whole scene in front of you looks different. You're able to pick out different sorts of information in front of you. So this is what the idea of different observatories that look at different parts of the light. So some observatories would be looking at x-rays, the other ones would be looking at UV emission. Uh, we have some that look at the light that is visible to the human eyes. So here is a small video uh, about how that helps us understand the structure of a system that is as complex as the pulsar wind nebula, such as the crab nebula. So in x-rays, we are able to see the pulsar and its surrounding material. There are energetic emissions coming from the poles of this pulsar. And this energetic emission is then able to light the material that is in the surrounding area of the pulsar. The magnetic field of this pulsar is able to generate copious amount of synchrotron emission that would be visible at IR wavelengths by observatories such as Spitzer. So this is the infrared vision in red that you can see here. The pulsar sits inside of this nebula. And then we go on further to the energetic emission, the heating of the elements in its surrounding. So you see different elements glowing in this cloud of gas around this pulsar. And you see oxygen and sulfur, and they're visible in the light that is seen by the naked eyes. And then finally again, if you take all of these insights, the visible light, the infrared light, the x-rays, you're able to build up this joint picture of what a pulsar wind nebula looks like. So pulsar wind nebulas are formed when a star goes supernova and leaves behind a lot of material that surrounds the pulsar and then pulsar's energetic emission interacts with this nebula. So the visible light outer shell that you can see here, isn't that gorgeous? And you can see all the filaments and the structures in this particular nebula. So now we are able to do such really interesting studies. And the question is, why do we want to do such studies? It's because pulsars after black holes are some of the strongest gravity, some of the densest objects in space. And we would like to understand how they originate better. And this is what I meant, NASA observatories, being able to build a picture of the complex 3D structure surrounding a really young pulsar that was just born 1100 years ago. I know 1100 is a long for a human lifetime, but for a pulsar, not so much. That's a baby pulsar. So apart from these kind of uh, you know, young pulsars, as I said, some of these young ones have really intense uh, magnetic fields. So you take a normal pulsar and you crank up its magnetic field uh, by about a factor of 1,000 to 10,000. Such an intensely magnetized pulsar is called magnetars. So the way they were discovered is also really surprising and funny because what happened is that in 1979, there were two probes of Venus, uh, Venera 1 and 2, and these were hit by a powerful gamma ray emission. Simultaneously, lots of satellites around Earth also registered a really powerful gamma ray emission. And over time, they found that this gamma ray signals appears and disappears. So that's why they were called as gamma ray repeaters. They had so much energy that in about 0.2 seconds, you can release as much amount of energy as our sun would in about 1,000 years. Apart from this, uh, so in 1992, after a wait of about almost for 13 years, Duncan and Thompson were finally able to figure out that these magnetars must actually be neutron stars, which have these kind of intense magnetic fields. 
So in summary, magnetars are really volatile. They have these magnetic fields that are so powerful. And because they are so powerful, they have lots of tensions and torques and twists around itself, leading to really intense bursts. So they are highly energetic and the magnetic field that is about 10,000 times stronger. The other thing that happened in these 20 years that such magnetars were being figured, you know, people were trying to understand what they are, was at the same time, some X-ray pulsars were found. So we talked earlier about radio pulses coming from these systems. Uh, they were also now being detected with X-ray telescopes in space. So these, uh, these kind of X-ray pulsars were called anomalous X-ray pulsars. Uh, because they had, they were extremely energetic and their intensity was so much more than if the pulsar is just spinning and releasing emission from its pole, it, it was way more than the energy just coming from its pole or the spin down energy. So the conclusion there was, this must have to do something that has to do with a magnetic field of a neutron star. And so in 2002, this is Victoria Cuspe, uh, Victoria Caspi is a highly renowned professor at McGill University in Canada and has been awarded with several awards such as Canadian Order of Merit. Victoria was able to connect, oh, these anomalous X-ray pulsars, some of them show gamma ray bursts, which are exactly like gamma ray repeaters. And this essentially doubled the number of known uh, magnetars to about 30 that we know of right now. Okay, so lots of things that we're learning today and lots of weird pulsars, but the one that really won the Nobel Prize, this was PSR 1913 plus 16. So when I say PSR, that just means a short form for pulsar. And then 1913 plus 16 is like the area code and then the house number in space. So this system was found by Joseph Taylor and Russell House and it comprised of a pulsar from which we could see energetic emission coming from the poles in an orbit with another neutron star. However, this neutron star was, they could figure it out because by trying to model, oh, this pulsar is spinning so fast, but then its spin period is changing uh, because, you know, uh, and the orbital period of it is, you know, uh, based on the orbital period that is also varying because every time the pulsar completed an orbit around this companion in about 7.75 hours, there was a small change in how the pulse was being received and therefore a change in how they understood the circular orbit of the pulsar looked like. So they concluded there must be another object near this pulsar that weighs almost as much as neutron star. So this must be a neutron star binary. And Joe Taylor's student, uh, Joel Weisberg. So Joel Weisberg is one of the most wonderful human beings I have ever met in Pulsar Astronomy and who I get to uh, proudly call my friend, although we have a huge age difference. So Joel, in his PhD thesis, made this plot. What this plot show is that exactly the thing that over a period of time, how does the orbit of two neutron stars, one of them a pulsar and another one not so much, revolving around each other change? And there was an extra term that they couldn't account for. This extra term was the energy that this system was releasing. So it was causing ripples on the space-time fabric. And this energy, when it was coming out, led to shrinkage of the orbit of the two neutron stars. So they were going within each other and falling into each other's gravitational potential by a value that is about three millimeter for every orbit. And so this was the first evidence that you can see uh, ripples in space time as or the gravitational waves. This is the evidence that has led to a, an exploration. So it's, it's something that launched a thousand ships, uh, kind of an exploration. So there we built LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. What this does is that there are two different arms that you can see. 
and they measure how the length of these arms change by a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction as these ripples from two neutron stars colliding with each other pass through our planet Earth. And so this happened in 2017 when they saw two neutron stars actually collide with each other, providing a very, very direct evidence of gravitational waves. And so finding these weird, weird pulsars have changed our insights of the universe so much. And then there was another binary found where it was not just a pulsar with a neutron star, but both of them were pulsars. So you could study effects. Uh, so this was 0737 minus 3039 area code plus the house number found in 2003 by Martha Burke with the Parkes radio telescope dish that you can see in the background. And what this system is able to do is it allows us to see predictions from general relativity, such as if there is a gravitational field, it should bend the light by a certain amount. And this is exactly what is observed. So these kind of pulsar objects, when you find 3000 of them, you find some of the weirdos and they allow us to test some of the some of the physics at a level, at a level of gravity that was not possible before. And my favorite system that's coming up is when they found a pulsar very recently in 2014 with another pretty dense star called as a white dwarf. And on the outside of this binary, which is in the inside, there was a third white dwarf. So what they could do essentially is to replicate the experiment that Galileo did. So Galileo did this experiment. What he did was he threw a ball and a feather from Leaning Tower of Pisa. And both of them, irrespective of what the composition of these two objects is, should fall in the similar manner in a gravitational field of our Earth with pulsars by using systems like this, the triple system, you can do this experiment in space. What you're going to track is over time, how do these pulses that are arriving towards us change? And based on that change and modeling it, we can really show that both these white dwarf and pulsars are falling in the strong gravity of this white dwarf in a similar manner. So this is really, really fabulous way to test out Einstein's predictions. And for this, again, they used a plethora of radio telescope dishes all over our planet Earth. So finally, we are coming to pulsars that I have been studying for the last four years. The ones that I said rotate extremely fast, millisecond pulsars. These are the systems that rotate faster if you take a small motor and attach it to a wheel. That's about 400 revolutions per minute. And a pulsar would be able to do 600 revolutions in a second. That's faster than a human being can think. So that's about 2,700 rotations per minute. And the highest speed of pulsars that we know currently is about 30,000 rotations per minute. So the question is, how do some of these pulsars get to such insane speeds? And if you recall, at the start of this talk, I had mentioned that sometimes they can have companions that are able to transfer mass and angular momentum onto the neutron star in the center. So this is a movie of that. So you have this companion it's getting heated because of the energetic emission from pulsars and it fattens up and fattens up and overcome its, comes its own gravity to form this accretion disk around the pulsar. So this small disk consists of material coming from this companion star and this material then gets onto the pulsar, torquing it like you, know, you have a small rotating wheel and an arm, and this arm is going to torque it up, 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 and to speeds as high as 600 times in a second. Uh, this system was found by Anne Archibald, who was then PhD student in McGill with Victoria Caspi, who we had learned about before. And Anne was just, what happened that 
at that point was Green Bank Telescope was not able to really work. This is the telescope that I was telling you about in Virginia that looks at each part of the sky and collects radio waves. So it couldn't really do that, couldn't move from its own position. So what Anne was doing is, why don't we just let the whole sky drift because the Earth moves across the telescope and then use all the data we collect to look for interesting systems. And this is where she found this particular interesting system, which showed this active process happening where a pulsar was being spun up by forming such an accretion disk. And these pulsars are called transformer pulsars because one moment they look like, look like this with no disk and the second moment there is an active uh, uh, transfer of material going on. So, and now I get to continue the tradition by working with Anne and some of the other people I had mentioned before by using Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, to, and what I could find, find in my PhD is that if you take UV emission from Hubble, you're going to see the lighthouse effect that we had previously seen in radio and in X-rays. So pulsars are really, really weird, but they are really, really cool. And what they allow us is to provide lab labs, uh, provide the strongest magnet in the universe, provide conditions such as the most extreme density uh, in the universe. So we can then try and understand what kind of a material sits inside this pulsar. So it, these are irreproducible conditions on Earth. And to do that, what has also helped is new technologies and new telescopes, such as this tiny white box that sits on the International Space Station called the NICER telescope. And so this is the tiny, sorry, this is the tiny box that is then able to look at different pulsars at the in the highest of sensitivities and figure out what their in insides, what their composition looks like by teams of people such as Dr. Anna Watts at the University of Amsterdam, who used this particular telescope NICER and several other ones such as XMM Newton and who studies different types of neutron stars to understand what they are really made of. And what we have re very recently, uh, as early as this week have found is that they could nail down the radius of such a pulsar to about uh, a precision that is so high, it's almost like finding out how big is Washington DC to about within one quarter mile, as mentioned by one of the authors of this study, if you're looking at this system from at least a few parsecs away, or at least like, you know, a few light years. And from there, you could figure out how big is Washington DC. So these are the extremely fun kind of experiments in space that you can do, and you can detect objects such as supermassive black holes falling into each other by using a network of these pulsars and understanding how their signals change uh, with different telescopes all over the world. So I would like to end this talk by saying uh, one thing that we shouldn't forget is that finding 3000 of them have helped us probe physics in ways that was not possible before. But at this particular point of time, we should keep searching for more oddballs, more space oddities, because as my hero, Justin Bell Burnell, who found the first of the system says, if you assume that you have arrived, we stop searching and we stop developing. So it's time to push forth and find new systems and change our understanding of astronomy. And this is what I would like to leave you with. Thank you. Hooray. Great job. Thank you, Amruta. Very compelling presentation. Um, audience members, we encourage you to, uh, we've already had a number of questions, at least in the YouTube live chat, but we're also broadcasting on Facebook Live. So we encourage people to uh, write their questions below in the chat box and we'll try and address them. But before we get to the rest of the Q&A, um, our Q&A panel is is not just Amruta, um, it's also me. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels um, and two other members. Gina and Treas, will you, will you join us? Aha, welcome guys, welcome. Um, so I'll just allow everyone to introduce, introduce ourselves really quickly and, and what sort of stuff we work on. 
Um, and you guys are welcome to ask questions. Audience members, you guys are welcome to ask questions about uh, the content of Amruta's talk and neutron stars and pulsars and, and all of that. But you're also welcome, you know, if you have some burning question that's been pestering you for weeks about uh, Mars landing or something like that, uh, we're happy to answer questions on anything related to astronomy or space science or uh, physics. So, so let her rip. Uh, but first, um, Gina, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Amrita, for a, an excellent talk. I'm Gina Panapulu. I work in Caltech as a postdoc, um, postdoctoral fellow, and I study the stuff that makes stars. It's called the interstellar medium. I work on uh, measuring things in the interstellar medium, like magnetic fields that we can't see. Awesome. Andreas? Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, great talk, Amrita. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Treyas Vesaprega. I'm a fourth year grad student in the Planetary Science Department at Caltech. And uh, these days I've been studying the evolution of planetary atmospheres. So in particular, I use a telescope near San Diego called Palomar Observatory to uh, look for hints of helium in the atmospheres of these planets, uh, planets outside our solar system, I should say. And I use those measurements to constrain uh, how quickly their atmospheres are losing mass. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Oh yeah. And I'm uh, Cameron. I do, I'm a postdoc. I do computational modeling of how galaxies form and evolve in the larger context of like a big chunk of the universe. And just, yeah, trying to understand galaxies and why they do the things they do. That's the main thing. Uh, okay. So let's see questions. Lots and lots and lots of questions. Lots of good questions. Here's a really hard one, but I figure we could all take turns on this. If we were to have any hope of replicating the conditions in a neutron star in the laboratory, how might we, how might we actually do it? Because these neutron stars, right, we talked about, or Amruta discussed this, you know, they're super dense and super hot and super gravitational fields and all these things. So super magnetic fields, how would we, how would we do it guys? What do you think? I have yep. a, a different kind of an answer maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was actually this paper in 1988 before I was born uh, from uh, I'm not trying to flex on anyone present here, but yeah. So in 1988, there was this wonderful paper by someone called Richard Epstein. And the question he asks in that paper is, what are the acoustic properties of neutron star as if neutron star is a guitar? Um, and what he mentioned that is, if you take a sound and you try to pass it from one end of the neutron star to another, this is going to look very much different from the sound that you started out with. Because you start, what is sound, but it's just, you know, compressions that are being passed through the surrounding medium. But if your medium is also able to compress it in directions that were previously not present by using transverse modes of this compression, you're going to look at a sound that's very, very different from what you started out with. So it just reminded me of this paper uh, from 19. I think, yeah. So, uh, but the second part of this question is uh, like traveling at the speed of light. I'm not really sure about that. So, uh, oh, that, I think that was a separate question. Oh, that is a separate question. Okay. Okay. We can we can we can address that one. In a second. Okay. Um, so yeah. So uh, yeah. So. I, this was for, for the question of whether, so Amrita, you 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 mentioned like it, it wouldn't be possible to make these things in the lab, and so just just for, for scale, uh, we can think. Let's take CERN, right? CERN is the uh, gigantic accelerator, particle accelerator that we have in in Switzerland, and so that uh, we can use to accelerate protons at uh, energies of, I had notes here, 6.5 TBs um, per beam. So that's, that's crazy energy. Anyway, so in each beam of this um, 
of protons that the accelerator can accelerate. There are 10 to the 16 protons. So hell of a lot of protons. Sounds like a lot, right? But if you measure the, the mass of these things, it actually only adds up to 10 to the minus 11 kilograms. So that's um, 0 0.00011 zeros <laughs> before that one there. Whereas yeah. if you take a teaspoon of the, of the material of the neutron star, that weighs like a ton. So there's no way we can we can put all that matter together at these kinds of densities. Um, yeah. Yeah. It seems like there's so much about these neutron stars that like you could take any one aspect of it, whether it's the magnetic field and the magnetic field that's associated with them is a trillion times higher than we can create in a lab mm -hmm. here with, you know traditional methods, but not just the magnetic field, then yeah, the surface gravity, like the escape velocity for one of these things is like a third the speed of light. So in the same way that here on Earth, in order to go into space, you have to exceed the, the escape velocity. And that's why we have big rockets to propel them. I forget, you guys remember off the top of your head what the rough escape velocity is for the, for the Earth's surface? Uh, probably no. 2gm by c squares under root square root so oh god it's like wait i have it top of my brain it's not nearly the same i think the order of magnitude is 10 kilometers per second okay okay yeah that seems Seems... Yeah, like eleven point two, I think, kilometers per second. Oh wow! Yeah, that's precision. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, whereas whereas the speed of light is substantially faster, uh, three times ten to the fifth Eight meters kilometers per second. per second. Well, meters per second, yeah, but kilometers per second. So so yeah, so like three thousand times higher speed. <laughs> velocity than it is to get off the surface of the yeah. earth so but what i mean one of the interesting aspects of what that means though is like if that's the speed at which you have to achieve to escape from the system then anything falling on to the system you know these accretion disks that amruta you were talking about where the stuff is is forms this disk and then flows onto it that means anything flowing into that is slamming into the surface at like almost the speed of light which is just crazy so it, unfortunately, that because of the densities of the magnetic fields or any of these things, I think it's one of those things that we just have no conception of even being able to draw, like create something like this in an actual physical laboratory. Unfortunately, yeah. No. I mean, and, and, <laughs> and how do you hold things together at a temperature that comes? You know, like if you're trying to maintain that density, you're going to have an extreme amount of, like, you're going to create like past critical limits of the matter. And so how do you do that in a lab? It's almost yeah. impossible with current instruments. Computer simulations are our friend, I think. Yes, you yes. Can, you can model this in a virtual environment. Yeah, and, and this is what a lot of people who work with the NICER telescope do, is that they have a lot of these simulations going to try and understand, okay, we take a factor, which is like the density, crank it up, or we change the pressure inside a neutron star, um, or we change how much of the surface layer is made of, you know, a particular type of material. And by using these kind of combinations, then you can figure out, okay, uh, where do the observations lie compared to these predictions from simulations? And then they're able to predict what's inside a neutron star, so. Okay, moving on to another question. Does a pulsar always have a uniform equilateral like rotation kind of like the earth or the sun or is it more chaotic um what do you guys think so um so i'm trying to understand so when you say equal rate of rotation um I'm i think it's just is it can you, here, here's my roll of tape my cheap uh uh rotation thing so is it just doing this or is it is it going like all chaotic like in the rotation or is it just like rotating around <laughs> so uh, 
Okay, so if it comes to like the change, we can observe that, for example, in the double pulsar system, if it has a companion and there is a lot of precession in the system, then it would be, you know, rotating in a chaotic manner. So it needs something around it that's actually kind of knocking it from time to time to be able to knock it from the regular rotation. Um, the other thing is the speed itself of the rotation can change over time because of, uh, you know, what's happening really with the pulsar if it's how if it goes undergoes something called as breaking or you know there are crust you know quakes that are happening on its surface these kind of phenomena can actually change uh, the rate at which it spins like for example in magnetars you have such intense energetic outburst it tears through the surface of the magnetic field tears through the surface of the neutron star and the magnetic blocks come out from there and there is a lot of torsion just from that process uh, so it can lead to really chaotic uh, rotations in these kind of systems. Yeah, that's interesting because it seems like just by itself, it won't be chaotic, right? Because there's conservation of angular momentum. But I guess if it's getting perturbed by a friend who's nearby, who's moving it around. Or, or its own magnetic field, which is a magnetic field on steroids that's not really settled because it's too young and too volatile and, you know, too rebellious of pulsar to be. So, yeah. <laughs> I like that. The rebellious yeah. pulsar. Yeah. Um, okay. Here is, uh, this is an interesting question. Are pulsars distributed evenly around the known universe, or do they tend to be clustered in different areas? Okay. So you, know, you wanted to pipe in on this potentially as well? Does anyone want to help with this? Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, I can show an image. If that's oh, cool. Okay. So let's see, uh, wait, 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 wait. I have too many things in here. So, Neutron stars, um, as Amrita told us, uh, are basically the remnants of young, massive stars, right? Can you see my screen? Yeah. So what I'm showing you here is uh, a nearby galaxy. It's uh, very well known with the name Whirlpool Galaxy. It's basically two galaxies um, that have collided. This is a bigger one. This is a smaller one. But what, what I wanted to show you is that um, you see these pink dots here? These are all regions where there's active star formation. So those are the regions where most of the massive and young stars, most of these precursors or pulsars are, are created. And so pulsars are expected to, first of all, be born primarily in the spiral arms of these kinds of galaxies, if, they're, if they live in a spiral galaxy. And eventually they'll sort of run around with all the other stars and sort of mix, but basically remain mostly within the disk of the galaxy. So if you're looking at, um, you know, pulsars in our galaxy, you expect them to be mostly in the plane of the galaxy, not too much up and down. Um, but people can can chime in with more uh, things to note. Yeah. Um, so we expect this, but also there are pulsars that are born with kicks, because sometimes these pulsars uh, get kicked out from the place that they were in because they were interacting with their surrounding uh, bodies, like surrounding stars gravitationally. And what happened was uh, if uh, during their birth process or during the time that they were having such kind of uh, interactions that are pretty rapid or like dynamical interactions, what happened is there is a heavier mass star that replaces them from the system. They can be yeeted out and, they, and you can find these kind of pulsars then further away from the galactic plane itself. And you can also find the older millisecond pulsars uh, further away in, and because they have had a long time to evolve and a long time to move through the space. And at the same time, they've also had these kind of uh, dynamical interactions in different clusters. So we see more of millisecond pulsars in these kind of crowded regions. Um, and, and then we can see some of them as well above the plane. So, yeah. So they're called millisecond pulsars because they rotate once per millisecond? 
Oh, I mean, that is the ideal millisecond pulsar that everyone would like to find, but that is also bending the laws of matter quite a bit. But the these are called milliseconds because they have spin periods of the order of few milliseconds. So like 1.6, 1.2, 1.3, these kind of milliseconds. So that's about rotations in 600, 700, 500 rotations in a second. Uh, so you take this ginormous star and it's rotating 600 times in a second. So just just imagine that for a second in front of your eyes. Wow. Wait, so what, what then speed is the surface? Because we have constraints on the size scale of these, right? Because of neutron degeneracy pressure and stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, earlier in the talk, you said like 10 kilometers or so in size. Yeah, so 14.2 like miles. I don't know how that translates. I'm still learning kilometers and miles. It's a long process. That's a <laughs> hard conversion. Um, so it depends. Um, so ideally, 10 to 10 kilometers onwards, 10, 11 kilometers onward. Yeah. That's, that's the finest. Yeah. <laughs> how much is 14 miles? I should have that better. Uh, more questions. Wow, so many questions. We have to <laughs> have a keeping track with them. Um, oh, yeah. There Stephen, are Stephen Schreier asks, do neutron stars have event horizons? Event horizons you may be familiar with from the idea of black holes. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the, the region at which, uh, at which the once you go in, you don't come back out. Um, so do neutron stars have event horizons? How close could a space probe get to a neutron star or a magnetar without being drawn in? Uh, so for the space probe part, it's, you know, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousand miles, is, which is a good distance that you should maintain because if it's a magnetar, it would vaporize all the material, so the probe wouldn't exist anymore. Um, depending on how strong the magnetic field is. Um, because I mean, their magnetic field is so high that if it is at a distance somewhere between Earth and, I mean, at a distance of, you know, half the distance between Earth and Moon, it would wipe out all the cards, all the credit cards on planet Earth, kind of a dis magnetic field. <laughs> so this is the thing that we don't, think so much about black holes that we also need to think apart from gravity there's additional thing that stops us from going near them um, and then about the event horizon so the event horizon is basically ruled by the not being able to get any light back from once you cross this particular threshold um, in case of neutron stars uh, although the gravity is massive light is able to escape its grasps so you, would, you wouldn't really have this kind of a distance at which you would stop seeing things. And which I'm really glad about because that is how we are looking at neutron stars and understanding what the insides of them looks like with different telescopes. So. Yes, okay. Some more questions. Um, one note to our audience is while I understand everyone is neutron star and pulsar crazy right now, we do have a, a planetary specialist on our panel. So we can also handle questions in the field of planets and exoplanets uh, with Shreyas. And, uh, and we have a magnetic, magnetic field expert and uh, focusing on the stuff from which stars are created with Gina, so so we can we can handle questions on those front too, just so we don't, you know. So poor Shreyas gets some love here. Shreyas, yeah, everybody loves planet. So, um, okay. So continuing on with a few more questions. In science fiction, I've read pulsars being used to facilitate navigation in interstellar space. Is this a feasible idea? Does anyone want to take this? Or I would be super happy to take this. By all means. Okay, so it's not just in science fiction. There are actual scientists who are trying to, uh, you know, there are multiple papers that have been written since 1970s to use pulsars as a GPS system in space. 
And that is because even compared to GPS, when you're looking at pulsar clocks, they are precise. They're so precise. They're like even like 10 to the power of six times more precise than some of the most accurate clocks that we have. So if you have such a clock and if you know exactly where the signal is coming from, it's so stable, you can use it as a standard reference point in space. And because you have both profiles, you can identify, okay, this is this particular direction that we're looking at, this is XYZ pulsar, and then you can use a network of these pulsars all over the space. So you create also a navigation system. Uh, and so this is something, there are actual papers that some of my colleagues have been writing, and they're so fantastic. This is like opening up your morning newspaper and reading the best science fiction, but it's not a science fiction anymore, it's actual reality because of pulsars. So, yeah, so that is possible and it's really interesting. Um, one of the other fun facts, do you guys remember the Voyager gold record? Yeah. Was... Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to the Voyager gold record where we told aliens where exactly we are. Okay, I'm, I don't wanna bring aliens into this, but Someone actually mentioned this in the chat. People are, are well aware of this. Yeah, people are well aware. Okay, so uh, I just but wanted to show it for the benefit of those who would like to, but if you would already know, that's fine. No, not everyone knows. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Oh yeah, please. So um, I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay, so can you see this gold record that was sent with Voyager? And you see this kind of a structure with like, you know, different lines coming out of it, right? And so this is the distance scale of the structure. So if you're looking at two of these markings, the distance between them, like these kind of small, small markings, the distance between them is one astronomical unit. And what this structure shows is this is Earth at the center of it all. And the distances of these different lights show we are, for example, X, Y, Z AU from Gaminga, and then a few AU from Crab, and a few AU from this another pulsar in space. If you get these three points, you will be able to triangulate where those three lines cross, and the center of that is Earth. So if you ever find this record, come find us at this coordinate. So that is basically what the idea was, to use pulsars as a way to find Earth. But how would they know which pulsars were the ones being referenced in the record? So they wouldn't really care about what was being referenced. What they would only care about, this is the energetic emission that's coming from this particular patch of sky. Mm. Um, so I think the idea is to just take those, the brightest ones in that area. So that's why I mentioned like Kaminga and all of these, the brightest systems. So you take the brightest pulsars in that direction and then you use them to triangulate Earth in space, I think. I think it's kind of in the same way that if you just have a random picture of the night sky, uh, you can usually triangulate where exactly you're looking at using something like astrometry.net, which does the exact like same thing. Yeah. So. Nice. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, we've got some questions, some questions for Shreyas here, passing the exoplanet love. Um, oh, lots of them now. What are the reasons for the high temperatures seen on ultra hot Jupiters? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, the primary reason is that these planets are extremely close to their host stars. So uh, if you think about uh, you know, our orbit, it takes us one year to go around the sun. So that sort of requires us to be a certain distance away. We call that one astronomical unit. Uh, but ultra hot Jupiters, these are planets that go around their host stars on orbital periods of like a day or some of them are even shorter than a day. They make their entire orbits around their stars. And so that requires them to be extremely, extremely close um, where they're just getting bombarded with high energy radiation uh, from their stars. And that uh, is, is really good at heating them up. And uh, yeah, wouldn't be, wouldn't be great places to live. Not great places to live. Not even on our Jupiter would be that great of a place to live, I suppose. Um. 
All right, a question from Amina Musa. Why are magnetars considered as a possible source of fast radio bursts? Are there any other types of pulsars which are also candidates? So just to make sure everybody is, is up to speed, fast radio bursts are uh, these pulses of radio waves that we've received from distant target, uh, distant objects in the sky have only been discovered in the last five to 10 years or so. And we only because we haven't really had instruments that were sensitive to this sort of thing. And it was recently discovered in, in the last year, actually by um, a team and a graduate student here at Caltech, uh, Chris Bohenik, um, that these pulses, these bursts that we were seeing the results of, you know, they only last for a very short period of time, like, like milliseconds. So it's one of those things where you like hear it and then you're like, you look over and, and you, don't, you don't know where it came from because it, it was so, such a short last. But they happened to be looking in the, in the region and were sensitive to be able to localize it on the sky. And it looked like it was a magnetar, um, one of these powerful neutron stars that, that Amruta was discussing. And uh, so, yeah, so that's super interesting uh, and, and, and well-designed question here. Uh, you guys wanna, does anybody wanna chime in here? Why are magnetars considered as possible sources for FRBs? Or could other pulsars do it? I think it's simply because magnetars are the most powerful magnetic structures that we know of. And, um, yeah, and recently there was this find, which is the soft gamma repeater or the magnetar that is present in our own galaxy, 1935 is 2154. It showed those kind of bursts that you expect from fast radio bursts. And this was done by actually a few people who are at Caltech. Uh, so this was an instrument that is that currently sits at Owens Valley Telescope called as the STAIR-2. And what STAIR-2 does is just collects these radio waves from uh, objects which are as bright as these fast radio bursts. And what they recorded then was one of the bursts that they had seen was coming from our own galactic magnetar, 1935 plus 2154. And it was, you know, repeating um, like we have seen so far from some of the repeating FRVs that have been observed with giant telescope in Canada. And finding that system really nailed down this explanation for repeating FRVs that they should have an origin, which is uh, in the magnetars um, and really intense magnetars. A question for Gina, is the interstellar medium fairly mixed or is it lumpy? And would that affect the sort of solar systems that can be created depending on how clumpy or uniform the distribution of the gas is? I like the question. <laughs> um, so the, the image I showed of M51 before, right? The world, whirlpool galaxy. Um, you saw that the, the regions where stars are forming, those pink dots aren't really evenly distributed, right? So we, we say, star formation is is clustered it, it happens here not here maybe here you know in, in in specific regions in space and that sort of reflects the fact that the interstellar medium so the gas is also clumpy it's not uniformly distributed throughout the galactic disk for example um, now whether the the morphology of the material so so whether it forms clumps or filaments or, 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 you know, different shapes, whether that the, the shaping of the interstellar medium affects how stars form and what kinds of systems stars and planetary systems form. That's like cutting edge research right there. <laughs> so it's, it's actually a big question in the star formation community, whether the fact that we see filamentary structures inside the dense clouds that are forming filaments, whether that affects the kinds of stars or the distribution of masses of the stars that are formed. So sorry, I can't really answer the question, but it's uh, we're working on it. Yeah, I think that's the highest compliment that we can give to questions when they, when they align with what, uh, what we're trying to actively figure out in the scientific community through our, our research, so. 
so well well posed um, here's a question can binary neutron stars entangle with each other through something like wormholes 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 is you know are a topic that gets brought up in science fiction a lot uh, for a way to travel fa faster than the speed of light through a black hole. We don't have any observational evidence or empirical evidence that wormholes actually exist. You know, I feel like the popular conception is if something falls into a black hole, it travels through a wormhole and then gets spit out by a white hole. Well, we don't know about the white hole or the wormholes. Uh, we do know about black holes for the most part. I mean, that's what the Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, last last year or this year last year when was it awarded a few months ago Wait, for the for the black holes like andrea gez and oh, the uh, andrea gez was last year yeah last year yeah i was time has no meaning to me anymore since the pandemic i'm like huh, huh. this is the wormhole now <laughs> that's right we're we're living in the wormhole really um so yeah, so the question ultimately is, can neutron stars be entangled with each other? Okay, so there's quantum entanglement, or could they be tied to each other through a wormhole? So we're dealing with a couple of different ideas. What, what do you guys think? That is actually a pretty hard question to think about for me, honestly. And I don't know how to approach this answer. I don't think, so in terms of the entanglement aspect, just speaking of quantum entanglement, normally quantum effects occur on microscopic scales for micro, microscopic particles. Uh, yeah. So, you know, quantum entangling of two electrons and their spin states and then separating them and having them remain entangled. That doesn't really happen for macroscopic objects. Uh, like stars or neutron stars or planets or people. Uh, there's just too many different quantum, uh, quantum structures combined into that macroscopic object where they get, they get, they influence each other and it gets too complicated. So that really doesn't tend to happen on that scale. So I don't think there's any reason to think that a neutron star could be like quantum entangled with something else. It's just too big. There's too too much going on. Um, but in terms of the wormhole thing, yeah, wormholes, it's possible, but given that wormholes, wormholes are generally associated, okay, again, this is, you know, a theoretical idea, not fully accepted, that uh, connects different structures in the universe, normally associated with black holes, since we just talked about how neutron stars don't have an event horizon because their speed of light never exceeds, or their, not the speed of light, their, their um, escape velocity never exceeds the speed of light. There's no like unknown region in the center. Yes, stuff falls onto it, but we can study that stuff by looking at the light that comes back from it. So I don't think there's any real reason to think that it's like some sort of portal that is, is transferring through the space, space time. But I don't know. I'm, I'm happy no, I to make sense. Yeah. I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Tia. No, I was going to move to a different question. Okay. So go ahead if you have something to say no. about Just like trying to remember, Malda Sena actually had a paper entertaining the idea of two black holes uh, doing something similar. Yeah, but I don't remember all of the paper and its details, but I kind of just remember the title of the paper that they did entertain the idea of two black holes interacting with each other. And then that entanglement leading to formation of a wormhole or something on those lines. Um, anyway, let's continue. It was just a comment, like a very small one. I'm sure. That's a good point, actually, because black holes are, they're not macroscopic anymore, right? They're singularities. We don't really know. Yeah. So yeah. Inside black holes, you know, yeah. quantum physics and microscopic objects, like sort of. Yeah, yeah. So that was the idea there. So, yeah. 
is there any way to detect pulsars with a fairly rudimentary radio telescope? Yeah, you can build your backyard radio telescopes. So, really? I mean, you can. I mean, it's, uh, for example, the first, okay, not pulsars, but the first radio signal from Milky Way that was detected by Urs was with a radio telescope he built in his own backyard in Netherlands. Because when you live in a country that is covered 90% of the time with clouds, you can't use a telescope in your backyard. So you bring, build a radio dish. So, but it, it would be a really, really bright pulsar and the dish would be humong, comically big that your house would look like a really weird house on the block and everybody would call you the person who it's like, you know. But there is an array of small antennas at the small telescopes called LOFAR in the Netherlands. And so if you look at its design, it's a really cheap design. It's, you can build it under like hundred euros because the base of it is styrofoam. The top of it is just like two antennas that are like a Christmas tree. Um, and that particular thing, if you like, you know, put an, a whole array of it, it doesn't look like a radio dish, but you can put an array of these kind of, uh, you know, small antennas, connect them, and then use supercomputers attached to their recordings to actually look at low frequency sky. And that's the idea of that telescopes. So you spend more on computers than the radio telescopes itself. I see. Yeah. But the antennae the, themselves are just a series of what look like Christmas trees sticking up at various Yeah, places. yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's also one in Owens Valley now, right? Like, these are the low frequency end of the antennas for radio astronomy. Not everything has to be a giant 100 meter radio dish that needs a whole arsenal of people to uh, kind of maintain it. You can use small antennas uh, and connect them and just do a small experiment. Oh, related to the Arecibo discussion, our last Astronomy on Tap had a, a gentleman from JPL talking about a, a proposed mission to build essentially a kilometer diameter radio telescope on the far side of the moon. Super cool. The Lunar Crater Radio Telescope. Of course, this won't be done for, I mean, if it is funded, won't be done for like 20 or 30 years, but still pretty sweet to think about a big Arecibo dish, but being yeah. on the side of the moon. Yeah, that would be really amazing. Hopefully nobody flies things around the moon. That's, That's right. In, in, interference in radio. That's all. That is true. Um, okay, I thought there was another good, I thought there was another good exoplanet question here for you, Shreyas. Did you see it? It was, there's so many good questions. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I'm like, I can, can, we can just sit here all night. I'm so yeah. Excited. I may have missed it just in the like enormous number of questions that we've got. This is yeah. Um, it's tricky to keep this all straight. Um, ah, from Andrew Reitemeyer, can you use the loss of helium in a planetary atmosphere to age the planet? and compare it to the age of its star. The loss of Whoa, helium. Okay, that's a neat idea. Uh, I, I think I see where you're coming from with the question. I, it's it's a, a really difficult thing to do, uh, to measure the, the helium loss rate. Um, as, as someone who does it, uh, it is one of the things that ensures that I have a job. Uh, so, I think the primary difficulty is you kind of don't know your initial conditions, right? You, you know how much mass is being lost, let's say per second. But if you don't know how much mass the planet like began with, or if you don't know like how that mass loss rate has changed over time, you can't actually use it to age date the planet. Um, it, it would be amazing if we had ways to sort of age date planets separate from their host stars so that we could kind of time when planet formation happens relative to uh, the actual formation of the star. But at this point, that seems not yet possible. Uh, definitely a frontier on which people are thinking. Why is there helium mass loss on planets? Oh, I mean, it, it's not just helium that's being lost. It's like uh, just mass that's being lost in general because of how close they are to the host stars. 
um, the atmospheres get heated up and okay. hydrodynamically kind of blows off. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so helium is just a really good tracer of that process happening because uh, fun quantum mechanics stuff can make uh, helium atoms absorb really strongly uh, in infrared light. Okay. Oh. Uh, I, I now discovered the trove of Freya's directed questions here. So I'm going to unleash a few of these on you. How come the first discovered exoplanet system is the only known pulsar with more than one planet that also, uh, where they also aren't as massive as Jupiter? So it combines the pulsar and the exoplanet thing. Because wasn't that the first ever exoplanet discovered was around a pulsar because of changes in the, like the inferred presence of it from change in the, in the pulse timing? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this would forever be the reason I would be upset if the planet, you know, the planet Nobel Prize not being given <laughs> to our planet. I think that's fair. Like, there's so many people that just say, you know, 1995, it was the first, like, planet around the sun-like star. But, yeah, the pulsar planets are 92. Uh, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. definitely, definitely a, a while before. Um, yeah. It, in, in response to the question, I, I think it's a great question. Honestly, without more statistics on like pulsar planets, it's really difficult to know. Um, yeah. When you have a sample size of one, it could be any number of, of possible explanations. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now we have related like three. To, like how the pulse formed and stuff. Wait, there are three? Now there are about three pulsar planets, uh, oh. like planets with pulsars around them. Yeah. But I, I think it's the only multi though, right? It's like the only multi-planet system around the pulsar. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How many it's are there? Of, and they're all low weight, right? Yeah, there's still some of the lowest planet masses that we've detected to date using any yeah. technique. Uh, yeah. Is it just because pulsars, because of the super, super stringent timing that we have, like you compared it to being much better than a, than a an atomic clock in terms of the timing. Is it just that that allows us to be more sensitive to lower mass planets than the other methods that we have, like radial velocity or, or that? That's a great, yeah, maybe that's about it. Or is it, is it observational bias that allows them to, to, to us to see that low of a mass or is it intrinsically that pulsars just have low mass systems around them? I, I think, I would think that the, um the sort of precision you can get from the timing of a pulsar helps a lot observationally. But like you said, like it's super difficult to know whether or not it's like an intrinsic thing without knowing kind of, like if you surveyed a bunch of pulsars systematically and then you only found like this one system, then maybe that's telling you something about how planets form around pulsars. Mm -hmm. um, but with one, it, it's really tough to know if, if really, you know, it's that, yeah. little bit of extra help you get from it being observationally accessible or not. It's pretty sweet. So I wanted to, um, uh, I've been monitoring the chat and there are several questions that touch upon the same topic of neutron stars and whether what happens, can they explode? Uh, do you want to touch upon those questions? Yeah, let's do it. So uh, I'll read all of them and you guys can decide. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. First was, can a neutron star rotate so fast that it tears itself apart or it will or will it collapse into a black hole and explode as a type 1a before it happens? And then right. I'll keep reading the, there are three more questions that sort of do the same thing. Okay? So there is a second question is, a hypothetical black hole collision with a neutron star, would the neutron star accrete or explode from tidal disruption? Third question, is there any mechanism in which pulsars themselves can explode, scattering dense neutron material across the neighboring space? Can some of it end up in the next generation of stars and planets? And final question that touches upon the same subject is, if neutron stars can't compress beyond a certain size, as proved in current experiment on size of neutron, uh, by what mechanism do they convert into black holes? So. All of these, basically, what happens to a neutron star? If you put like explosions, all explosions. People like to blow things up. I get it. Me too. Yeah, go for it. But they're all going to be implosions because of the strong gravity. Mm. A twist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So I guess we can we can kind of we can handle a few of the things that were brought up. So people talked yeah. about what happens when a neutron star gets more massive, say when it's drawing accreting material from a from a stellar companion. Now, they're orbiting around each other. This one's the neutron star. Oh, I've even got I have oh. all these things. You have props. Oh my God. Props. Oh, I have my Easter goodness. that my sister gave me for Easter that had oh, that is such a good approximation of a Roche lobe. Yeah. Oh yeah. See the Roche lobe. <laughs> Look at this. It's it's not a perfect sphere because the gravity of this structure is pulling it and so it extends out. So it would be oblong like this, always pointing toward exactly. a companion yeah. it's called the Roche lobe. Um and uh yeah, so they'd be orbiting around each other. And then maybe maybe this one would be delivering off some of its material onto the neutron star. Of course, this should be like minuscule and microscopic compared to the size of the star, but I only have yes. these props. Yeah. Uh, and eventually this will get so massive that what happens? Implosion. So would there be an associated explosion component or it would just go oh, and it would collapse into a, into a black hole? I honestly don't know. Depends on how much material we are going to suddenly dump onto it, right? Mm -hmm. Like what is the rate of transfer of mass? If you're going to, if you're doing it systematically with the Roche lobe, it's going to be slow and streamlined process of getting the mass onto it and the mass Having mountains. This around it. And yeah, and then the mass mountains, which are formed on the neutron star surface, would disperse because you know there is the you have like the transverse forces as well to deplete them, deplete, deplete them, and that is like a very slow mode of getting mass onto the neutron star. I the the fastest way you can make a massive neutron star is to collide two of them. Right. Yeah. If you collide two neutron stars in you know, a merger, you're going to form a hypermassive neutron star. And these kind of hypermassive neutron stars, we expect them to survive for a period of time before all of it falls inwards to form a black hole. Because the gravity is so intense that there is no pressure that's able to support the surface. So you cannot form a neutron star at a critical mass. So you are going to end up with a black hole in that case. Um, so the way to do that would be a sudden catastrophic event of transfer of a lot of material or combining two of those things together. Um, and we have evidence for that, right? There yes, was the neutron star mergers. Yeah. That we all over the news, what, three years ago, four years ago? Yeah, yeah. the 1708 17 that right. I showed briefly um, that it was such a bright event and such a beautiful merger with a very strong signal that now we are spoiled because, <laughs> because it was so strong that now we expect everything to look as beautiful and strong and wonderful merger in space and to easily detect it with our telescopes. But that's not the case as we've learned in the last three years of follow-up, so yeah. So did we handle all the questions? I, I feel like we didn't handle all the questions. What were no, the we other- didn't. There was a TDE question, tidal disruption event of it involving a neutron star. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what happens then. I think you can tidally disrupt a neutron star with a supermassive black hole. It would, I don't know how the process would look though. Might go, might be a weird process, not unlike another, I mean. Oh. It, well, because I feel like the dense material that, composes a neutron star is only dense because it's under under the gravitational field of the neutron star, right? And if you tear it up, you don't just have little chunklets of this super dense material that's just floating around. Like, I feel like it would change its equation of state. It would change its behavior taken outside the context of being under that intense gravitational field. And it might just go back to being like, I don't know, element. I don't know, it's being ripped apart. So I don't know what happens then. That sounds pretty awesome though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do we have evidence for tidal disruption events of, of a neutron star getting too close to a more gravitationally intense source like a supermassive black hole? Do you know? Not yet, I think. 
or we just need to wait another few million years and then there is the uh, galactic central magnet or that would do it. Wait, Sagittarius A star? Yeah, Sagittarius A can tidally disrupt. Oh, 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 I thought you meant that was gonna be the, the neutron No, no, cells. no, I was, I was just thinking like, yeah, give it a few billion years and we can and talk. stare at it yeah. and stump something. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a- Yeah, a few million, sorry, not billions, but okay. Yeah. I mean, we could wait that long too. I've got time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, were there other questions amidst those, Gina? Did we did we kind of cover them? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there was. Uh, did we say whether the neutron star can uh, break itself apart from rotation? Oh, right. So it's spinning. So I mean, we see this in all sorts of bodies, we see this in stars, we see this in, in, in planets, right? They rotate so quickly that they become kind of, oh, oh, it's got, this is prolate instead of- Yeah, maybe, maybe a little more oblate okay. than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on its side, on its side, that's perfect. Yeah, I'll just pretend that it's, it's uh, azimuthally uh, symmetric. So yeah, it gets spun out, if it's rotating like this, it gets spun out and turns into like a hamburger. Um, and that happens for all, for all sorts of objects. So it seems potentially reasonable if these things are traveling at, you know, their surfaces are traveling at some decent fraction of the speed of light that that they would get pulled into this uh, this kind of oblate shape, this hamburger shape. But I don't know if they could actually rip themselves apart. My guess is no. Conservation of energy, I don't think so. The, the rotation wouldn't be bigger than gravity in any case. Yeah, I don't think it could exceed the, yeah. Things get ripped apart because, well, do we have objects that are held together by gravity that can rip, rip themselves apart if they rotate too fast? I feel like the answer is yes. Just maybe not on that scale. So that is where the breaking index comes into play. Oh. Uh, so this is where, I mean, there is a certain period, period dot, you know, like how and how rapidly it's changing in case of a pulsar. This is where that one millisecond wonderful elusive pulsar, that is one of the reasons people think it might, we are not able to find sub millisecond pulsars is because it's just not sustainable. Uh, you're going to spin it so fast, it's going to break apart. So, uh, okay. yeah. Um, all right, questions, questions. Let's see what we got here. Could the cloud cover on Venus be removed or modified to cool the planet? Are there any new probe landings being planned for Venus? Our good friend Venus. What do you think, yeah, Trace? I, I saw this question and a related one about it being like potentially easier to terraform Venus than Mars. Uh, my, my general answer to those questions. So it's funny, actually, I think. Uh, when like the idea of terraforming first came around uh, from from who else but Carl Sagan, uh, I think it was Venus that he initially proposed terraforming before Mars actually. So the idea has been around for a while. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's pretty difficult. And I think that, I mean, we just know a lot more about Mars's surface and how there, there's, I think, more ideas floating around on how you would get an atmosphere on Mars versus remove an atmosphere or remove a substantial amount of Venus's extremely thick atmosphere. So I think in general, it's just, uh, it's pretty difficult to do. And especially considering that at this point, we don't even have a lander that can sit on the surface of Venus for longer than uh, 10 minutes or, or whatever the Venera probe uh, could can pull off. Fresh. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and to answer, I guess, the second part of that question, I know that there's active like work being done on trying to get a Venus mission going. Uh, the surface conditions are still really inhospitable. So it's, it's a difficult engineering challenge, but one kind of um, idea that has been thought through is instead of going down to the surface, 
you send a balloon mission or something to uh, the middle parts of Venus's atmosphere where the temperatures are actually much more like we're familiar with on Earth and also on Mars. So uh, there's all sorts of ideas for, for floating habit habitability in like the clouds of Venus and things like that too. But those are a little out there. And Ooh, like Cloud uh, City from, uh, from the Empire Strikes Mars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Clouds with Lando Calrissian. <laughs> Who uh, knows what we'll find? Yeah, you know, hopefully they send it and uh, and we see something like that. Yeah, I uh, one of my neighbors is an engineer at JPL who is working on a an instrument for a proposed Venus mission called I think it's called Da Vinci. Maybe it's called Leonardo. I remember it being associated with Leonardo Da Vinci, but but um, yeah, that's not funded or anything but it's a proposed mission so but i think the time scale over which that would fly is a decade plus so but yeah as you say it's incredibly difficult to engineer from an engineering perspective to be like oh yeah we've got this thing that needs to withstand thousand degree temperatures and like very high pressures like you're at the bottom of the ocean yeah. and actually do some reasonable stuff like that's super challenging well, I, I do hope that the uh, the sort of balloon mission engineering timescale gets a little shorter, hopefully, now that, you know, there's all this new stuff coming out about Venus, potentially phosphine, maybe it's there, maybe not. Um, so so I'm, I'm hoping that that accelerates the timescale a little bit, because I think there's a lot we still don't know. Sure. Mars has gotten all the love, and Venus is cool, too. Venus, Venus is the goddess of love. She should be getting some love, but no. Uh, it's because men are from Mars, and so are a lot of them from JPL. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess, so I guess coming back to the original question, like in terms of, or the, the thing that you brought up, I guess the task with Mars is in terraforming is taking the fact that there's very, very little atmosphere and making it more pronounced. And the, it's the opposite problem with Venus, that it's it's too dense of an atmosphere. And so you need to like, slough that off somehow and either way it's super hard and super expensive and challenging but yeah me. definitely difficult both ways the uh, the general sense that i get uh from reading around these days is that it's it may might be easier to do the mars thing but easier is like a super relative term like it's it's still going to be super hard in an absolute sense uh to even consider approaching either of those questions yeah, it seems like there's a there's a fascination with the idea of making a new start for our planet and an interplanetary species. And while that's interesting and intriguing, I think it's a lot easier to just not mess up our existing planet. And we should really focus on that, too, instead of just looking for a free get out of jail free card going to a new place. Yeah, agreed. You know, I think I think Venus is actually a really good uh, example for that. Uh, we are pretty sure that it underwent a process called the runaway greenhouse effect. Might have heard of the greenhouse effect. It had like a runaway version of that process happen wherein it lost, uh, we think all of its uh, surface water and now it's this terrible inhospitable place. So yeah, let's, let's work with what we've been given on the, uh, on the earth with its extremely finely tuned habitability. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, let's see. What other questions have we got here, guys? I'm scanning through them and having a difficult time of separating the ones we've addressed and with the ones that we haven't. Have any black hole neutron star collisions been observed with LIGO? Because we talked about the neutron star, neutron star one, and there have been Plenty now with black hole, black hole. Have there been any black hole slash neutron star ones? There have been the mass cap events and um, the 1908-14 BV event that looks like a neutron star black hole that I followed up with Chandra telescope as well. Um, what else? There are two more, I think one more interesting candidate actually, um, with not like a high significance one that was last year. Uh, towards the start of the pandemic um, before it all shut down. But yeah, so there is an evidence, but it's really hard to get electromagnetic emission from those so far. 
because they haven't been as like what I was this is what I was complaining about earlier is not every signal is as beautiful as GW 7917 is because it's not as bright we cannot get it with like other observatories to be able to see electromagnetic emissions uh, but there has been that mass cap event that was mentioned in the December press conference at AS um, yeah uh, here's a, a slightly different question from the nerdy walker. How does cosmic ray fission result in the formation of elements such as beryllium? This is a really interesting question. Uh, because so just some context to make sure everybody, everybody knows we're all on the same page. Cosmic rays are high high energy, high velocity, you know, objects that are traveling near the speed of light and they're little atomic nuclei. So like a proton or a helium nucleus or, or you know, an iron nucleus flinging along, uh, flinging along uh, going super, super fast. And they run into stuff. Sometimes they run into us. Uh, in fact, astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, once they got outside of the Earth's magnetic field, would report seeing flashes of light. The flashes of the light were when cosmic rays traveled through their eyeball and caused, uh, and or, because they're traveling near the speed of light, they actually exceed the speed of light in the in the, the, the medium of your eyeball. And so they cause something called Cherenkov light. And you can see that when you're just like up in space and a cosmic ray goes through your eye. I mean, it doesn't hurt you. But you're like, oh, I just saw a flash of light. Um, that's actually one of the main things that degrades the Hubble Space Telescope is the constant bombardment by these cosmic rays, these charged nuclei that are traveling at near the speed of light. They, they, they mess up the structure of the detector and, and, and the instruments there um, over time, over the years, that, decades that it's been up. But uh, Cosmic rays, when they run into stuff, just like anything that's going super fast, when it runs into something else, sometimes it breaks apart. It's a process uh, that was referred to here as fission, but generally it's called spallation because it, it spalls, it breaks into a part. So like if you shoot a bullet at something, sometimes that bullet, when it slams into whatever, whatever the target is, will break into chunks. And so if you have a heavy enough cosmic ray nucleus, let's say it's carbon, something like that. When it breaks into different chunks, those will be smaller and they will be uh, less massive. They'll, so there'll be different, different elements. It's essentially a way of creating different elements by slamming these things in at high speeds. And so you can create beryllium or lithium or boron, which are the third, fourth, and fifth elements on the atomic, you know, the Mendeleev periodic table of the elements. And what's important about those particular, those three elements is that we don't have other ways of really producing those elements effectively in the universe. They weren't produced in very high amounts during the Big Bang. Um, and because of kind of some, some arcana of how things work inside the interiors of stars, when you form heavier and heavier elements, those are essentially skipped you don't really form lithium, beryllium, and boron. And so the only real ways of forming these things is through something like spallation of these cosmic rays. So you can, you can kind of figure out, you can uh, age date things based on how long, like how many cosmic rays have slammed into the lunar surface or something like that based on the presence of these different, these different elements. But yeah, I don't know. I think that's a pretty interesting topic. You can also figure out how far away the cosmic rays are coming um, because of the time it takes for them to cross through the interstellar medium. And so that's another way, another thing that you can carbon date uh, is how far away are you seeing the cosmic rays come from? Is it a hundred parsecs? Is it one kiloparsec? That's a, another thing. Oh, and would the magnetic field strength of the interstellar medium cause them to like warp their paths and such? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Let's see. Only a few minutes left here, so get your get your questions in while you can. 
Do we do a rapid fire round or? Oh, know? we got to do a rapid fire round. Like one minute per questions, go, go, go. You know, everything <laughs> is answered, but. Uh, yeah. Do you guys see any, any ones that we should? I saw one that was, um, uh, it was, should a receiver be rebuilt? And my question would be a singular yes. This one is for the rapid fire round. Yes. <laughs> that is, I think, Stephen Schroeder's question. Um, yeah, let's, let's do it. Yeah. Should Arecibo be rebuilt? Yeah. I think the other use of Arecibo was also to track asteroids that are around our planet Earth. And I think uh, we do, we are doing that with some of the JPL, you know, um, with DSN, et cetera, but it's not the same. And I think having a large radio dish capability, uh, currently the largest one is now in China at 500 meters. And that kind of precludes um, American astronomers from being able to access such a valuable resource to probe fainter radio uh, uh, signals. The other thing is of course, uh, it's not going to be the most expensive observatory compared to things that we are building right now, for example, JWST or such. So this is only a fraction of the budget if they decide to actually put, um, you know. So one thing that you can do is you can have large missions, great observatories, but apart from that, you need like smaller observatories and Arecibo in its lifetime gave some of the most wonderful finds. So it gave us the double pulsar binary that won the Nobel Prize. It gave us um, one of the first pulsars in which recycling could be studied. Like these are the pulsars named after cannibalistic spiders called black widows because the pulsar's wind is completely eating up the companion. Um, so these finds and fast radio burst discoveries such as the repeater and being able to uh, understand its environment. These are the kind of capabilities that we can do with a dish that can probe at sensitivity limits that you just can't do with smaller radio dishes. So I think Arecibo has a pretty strong case for being rebuilt. Um, but also part of the discussion uh, is that, uh, you know, the land on which these telescopes are built is also- Oh yeah, that is. <laughs> <laughs> needs to go back at some point, which was promised. So, so that's also that also oh, yeah, yeah. Of where and how. All this yeah, stuff. where and how is the more complicated part, and yeah, the we moon. Have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, and one aspect of things that isn't really brought up a lot recently. I mean, Arecibo has essentially been on the chopping block for like a decade too. Like, are we going to continue to fund it? It's not that people don't want to fund it. It's that there's. Mm -hmm. There's only so much money that's allocated towards the National Science Foundation and towards NASA to continue to operate as well as build new instruments. And yeah. so in, within that context, there was a lot of concern. Uh, yeah, like I said, over the last decade, perhaps longer, that we're continuing to spend money to maintain this aging observatory, which I think is super interesting. Yeah. I've observed there. I've spent decent time there and I, I love Arecibo. Mm -hmm. But at the cost of being able to build some of the newer, more expensive. Uh, yeah, missions. So yeah. It's, it's yeah. hard. It's hard to decide what, what the best way to go. One thing that I did learn recently is that the Green Bank Telescope um, yeah. does now have the capacity to send up the broadcast and then reflect off of asteroids to be able to still do the spatial mapping with radar on their surface the way that Arecibo had been used in the past. Yeah, and, and then that came in, yeah, so I think that happened pretty recently, like this observation cycle. And when that came into effect, they also changed who can observe with Green Bank Telescope, that if you are someone who is a non-USPI, you need someone to supervise you. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it's changed recently. So why? I don't know, yeah. But anyway, let's not get into that. But yeah, um, that's a fun thing to know. I had almost forgotten about it, that it started already. Uh, okay, a couple more. How did, Teresa Wong asks, how did we know that a gravitational wave would hit LIGO? And how do we know that the collision happened 1.3 billion years ago? Hmm. 
We, well, I mean, to start out, we didn't know that it would hit LIGO. Uh, astronomical observatories, for the most part, aren't able to predict the future. Uh, most of the time, you're just like, if you're, if you're looking for transient, you know, short, short-lived events like a supernova or a gravitational wave burst from, a, from two black holes that are merging, you're just like looking up in the sky waiting. You know, it's like if you go out, if you yourself want to go out and watch a meteor shower, you don't yeah. know exactly where those meteors are going to go. You look up and you keep your eyes open and you just put yourself under the right conditions where you'd be sensitive to be able to actually see one of these things. And then you hope that one happens at the particular time that you happen to be looking. And that's, that's essentially what LIGO has been doing for, for like over a decade is staring up at the sky. And it only recently got beat down the, the sensitivity, uh, beat down the noise sources to be able to be sensitive to a bright object. So it was basically they were looking up in the night sky and the comparison could be made like they were looking up in the night sky waiting for a meteor, but there was too much light pollution around. And so then they went dark, they went to a darker sky site and then they looked up and then even though there were the same number of events happening, they were just more sensitive to being able to see them because they didn't have as much city brightness around them lighting up the sky. And so that's essentially what, what happened with LIGO. Um, but- This was the second part to that question as well, right? Yeah, there was the second part, which was, um, how do we know that the collision happened 1.3 billion years ago? And that is an answer that I do not know, that I do not know. I don't remember the details of, uh, of how you fit the waveforms, but it can tell you something about both the source as well as the in, intrinsic luminosity, I believe. Do you guys? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone want to do it? Or is it? In my life before pulsars, I used to do gravitational waveform modeling and template fitting. And so there are different kinds of parameters that you can fit for the intrinsic parameters that you know belong to the system, such as like what are the masses of the components, what is the inclination of the system, um, and there are uh, what is the, what are the spins that we are looking at, and then the other parameters which are extrinsic to the system as well. So when we are fitting the waveforms, we fit it as an ideal case condition of two black holes being two points and we are going to take all of their intrinsic parameters. And the luminosity is inversely proportional to the distance squared uh, or distance to the power of four, one of those two things. And from that luminosity estimate of the wave that we observed because of the gravitational waveform's amplitude, we can then inversely correlate it with the distance. And then distance is a proxy for how much time light took to travel to us. And that's the amount of time before which the collision happened. So that's how we go about it from the waveform fitting. Um, okay. There was a question early on, kind of, I think for our last question. So, uh, oh, so we nice. finished up strong. I know, I know. I know, it's only uh, 55. There, there was a question early on by Nikhil Shah asking, were there any books on the topic of pulsars that we would recommend. And I'm going to kind of generalize this question to be, are there books at a public level that we as scientists would recommend about our respective fields, astronomy or uh, planetary science or astrophysics that, that either was inspiring to us when we were starting to get involved or that have come out since then and we've been introduced to and we think would be a good recommendation for, for for others who are interested in the field. What do, what do you guys think? Well, first, uh, Amruta, do you know of any books about pulsars that you'd recommend to, to a, a public or advanced public audience? I'm trying to think. So there are lots of advanced materials about pulsars, but what, what one can read is that um, we recently had this 50 years of pulsar meeting and in which a lot of these people who originally found pulsars and found pulsar binaries came together and there are reviews written which are really small reviews but not really in a way that they are scientific, you know, like large scientific papers and their introductions are very approachable, 
um, and very easily readable. So if you look up these kind of uh, reviews from the 50 years of Pulsar meeting, I think there's a lot of material in there that is uh, useful. Yeah. Um, but in general, uh, what do, you, do you guys have any recommended tomes on the topic of I mean, it can both be nonfiction or fiction. If you found a, a particular science fiction or, or, or related uh, book oh. on this topic as a good recommendation, by all means. Um, there is the, I'm trying to remember. So uh, there is this uh, book in which they, have this idea that there is an alien species that leave, lives on top of the neutron stars and then they cannot just go in a linear fashion but they always, always have to go in a transverse fashion because of you know the way neutron stars and surfaces and this is like a fiction book and I'm trying to remember uh, what's the name of that book and I can't for the life of me. I think your dog knows though. I think yeah that's... oh my god she uh, she is not very happy that this is nine o'clock and why am I not the center of your universe right now? So there is a lot of drama going on. So yeah. She's your neutron star. You orbit around uh, she's, her. She's a magnetar. I thought about it. She's highly volatile, intensely energetic. Uh, she like, you know, is rebellious. So she satisfies as an Australian cattle dog, all the characteristics of a magnetar. Yeah. What's her name? Uh, actually her name is Rooney. And I also have uh, another name for her, which is Koji. That means explorer in Hindi. So, yeah. Okay. Um, any other any other books, uh, Gina or Shreyas, for books that you'd suggest to our audience? So, if if you like general relativity and black holes, I really suggest the Black Hole War. Um, by Leonard. Black Hole War. Yeah, it was it was awesome. Is it fiction or nonfiction? No, it's nonfiction. It talks about um, the debate between uh, Leonard Susskind and um, Hawking, Stephen Hawking, on, on whether information is lost when it enters a black hole or not. Oh, okay. Chris? Yeah, I will. Um, I'll shout out two books. Uh, one of them is by uh, a professor at the University of Washington called uh, Emily Levesque, and it's called The Last Stargazers. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it because it was a, a really interesting perspective on what it's like to be an observational astronomer, uh, and in particular, like someone who uses big ground-based telescopes, and it's someone who's like kind of just getting my footing in this field. I, I thought it was like a really cool uh, perspective to read. Uh, and the other one is called uh, The Glass Universe by an author named Deva Sobel. Uh, and this is about sort of the contribution of women astronomers in uh, the early 1900s at Harvard, uh, where there were a lot of discoveries made, uh, for instance, by folks like Annie Jump Cannon and, and Cecilia Payne. Uh, and I, th I thought that was also a really interesting historical account as well. So if you're into kind of like, Astro history, I think that's a that's a great book. I'm looking for not one stuck in my head, but I can't remember the title. Um, I'm just going to say a, a slightly non-standard answer. If there's a, a book that was written over a hundred years ago called Flatland. Oh yes, that's that I really one. that I really like. Um, it basically to give you the premise, it takes place in the perspective of a person or a character who lives in a two-dimensional flat plane as though they're on you know, a, a piece of paper and, and gives their perspective. And the, which also it's very interesting because it has like all this Victorian aspects of things because it was written in the Victorian period which is also intriguing, but for a different reason. Um, but each of the characters are different um, polygons. So there are circles and there are squares and there are triangles and you have different class statuses based on what your, your, your shape is. But that's also a side point. The, the, the most interesting thing is if you envision yourself living in this two-dimensional space and then you're spoken to by someone who lives in a three-dimensional space like us, 
um, the experience of you in two-dimensional space trying to comprehend what it's like to be in this three-dimensional space is much like us in a three-dimensional space trying to comprehend what a fourth-dimensional space looks like, which of course, I don't know about you, I don't have a very good idea of what a fourth-dimensional space looks like uh, because you think of, you know, draw a line and then draw another line perpendicular to that as your second dimension, draw another line perpendicular to the, both of those, that's your third dimension, and then do it a fourth time, draw a line that's perpendicular to each of those three directions. And you're like, huh, I'm out of dimensions, at least that we can perceive. But the idea is that potentially, you know, according to string theory or, or some of these, these additional theories, there are additional dimensions where mass can exist, but we don't have the capability of perceiving them. And so that gives you some idea of like the, the right questions to ask associated with, with are there additional dimensions? What could they do? What could they function as? Uh, but it's all from, the, all from the relation of just like this kind of thought experiment. It's really, really well done. It's short. Uh, I think it's because it was written early enough, it's, you can find it for free online because project like copyright doesn't extend back more than a hundred years. So you can find it for free on like a text file or a PDF online. Anyway, Flatland. I think the author is Abbott, but yeah. very, very interesting. I love the circles in Flatlands, no edges. Yeah, the circles are like the, the high priests or something, right? Yeah, because those are the only ones you can't see edges on. Oh, that's right, that's right. Okay, um, thank you everyone, audience members for your participation. Uh, many thanks again to Amruta Zaudand. Excellent presentation tonight. We really thank appreciate you. it, Doctor. And um, thank you, Gina and Treas, for joining us. Uh, it was it was great to have your opinions and 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 talk as always tonight with answering some of the questions. So um, we will be back in a in a couple of weeks for our next event, Astronomy on Tap. I forget what it's going to be on. I'll post it in the over the weekend. And then uh, our next stargazing lecture is a month off. Yeah, we're coming up on uh, our five-year anniversary of Astronomy on Tap, so we're gonna have we're gonna have like some prizes that we give away, and we're gonna have uh, some famous speakers. I'm trying to round up. Not that Amruda isn't famous, but uh, but uh, but um, keeping up with that, and then. And then we're also going to start doing some video clips on YouTube, but I'll, I'll talk more about that, like short, like non-live, like pre-recorded things explaining like this question or that question or whatever. So uh, yeah, more to follow, but thanks everybody. Thank you for joining and thanks Cameron for organizing. Oh yeah.